Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar with Danny Danone, Israel's outgoing permanent representative to the United Nations. Here is Dan Marieschen, CEO of B'nai B'rith International. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's conversation. I'm Dan Marieschen, CEO of B'nai B'rith. Thank you for joining us today. Today's discussion will focus on Israel at the United Nations and its complex diplomatic position within the organization. With me to explore that and more is Ambassador Danny Danone, Israel's outgoing permanent representative to the United Nations. We want to thank the B'nai B'rith Office of UN Affairs and the B'nai B'rith World Center in Jerusalem for making this interview possible and for their work in advocating for a strong and secure Israel. In today's conversation, Ambassador Denome will reflect on his five-year tenure at the UN, which marks its 75th anniversary this year. Prior to his UN role, Ambassador Denome was a member of Knesset for the Likud Party. He served as Deputy Speaker of the Knesset. He also served as Deputy Minister of Defense, Minister of Science, Technology, and Space. But before we begin today's interview, here's a video of highlights of Ambassador Danone's five years at the UN, which we've obtained from his office. No UNESCO declaration, no empty speeches, no General Assembly resolution will ever drive us from Jerusalem. And <laughs> Goldstone, אנחנו לא מקבלים את הדוח הזה. Why should Americans be concerned that Iran will take this to the next level? Look what Iran did in the past. They sponsored terrorism all over the world. למלא באמונה את תפקידי כחבר הממשלה ולקיים את החלטות הכנסת. It's got to be one of the toughest arenas to defend Israel in, and the man currently taking on that challenge, Israeli ambassador to the UN, Dani Danone. Despite the rising voices of anti-Semitism, today the reality is different. Today we have the state of Israel. Use this opportunity to start direct negotiations. If President Abbas was serious about negotiating, he wouldn't be here in New York. He would be in Jerusalem. This is a deed to our land. In this aerial photo that we are revealing today for the first time, you can see the complete transformation of this village into a terror terminal. our capital for 3,000 years, and no UN resolution can deny our connection to our eternal capital. Wow, you just said a mouthful there. That was chilling, Ambassador. We welcome the involvement, not only of the US, but other international players, even some of, some of the moderate Arab countries, but you need the Palestinians to be on board. And unfortunately, they prefer to go to France to come to the UN, but not to sit down and negotiate with us. אדוני עוז לעמו ייתן, אדוני יברך את עמו בשלום. We will keep fighting until anti-Semitism is finally defeated. עם ישראל חי. Ambassador Danone, welcome to the program. 
Shalom, Dan. Great to see you and to see so many friends. Well, before we uh, talk about the UN, uh, I'd like to go back in time uh, for a moment. Uh, you were born in uh, Ramat Gan. Your father was an immigrant from Egypt coming into Israel in 1950. Uh, he was severely wounded uh, in the war of attrition and uh, you lost him, unfortunately, at the age of 13. Uh, you studied at Florida International University, worked for the Jewish Agency in Miami for a time, uh, then got your MA at Hebrew University and you became a leader in the Beitar movement and in the Likud party, member of Knesset, uh, Deputy Speaker, all of the, the things that we've talked about in, in our introduction. But let me ask you, along the way, did you ever think that you'd be returning to the United States in one of the highest profile positions in international diplomacy? So first, Dan, I'm happy uh, to be here today. I want to thank you, uh, David uh, Michels, the UN Affairs Director, and my dear friend, uh, Adam Snyder from, uh, from Jerusalem. And uh, I worked with Bnei Brit in the past and looking forward to continue to work with you in the future. I always was an advocate for, for the Jewish people. As you mentioned, my late father was severely wounded in the war of attrition in a fight with terrorists in the Jordan Valley. And unfortunately, he lost his hearing uh, abilities uh, in that uh, fight. So I became uh, a spokesperson for my father. I remember uh, going with him to the bank in Ramat Gan at the age of five, and arguing with the teller about the interest rate, about the bureaucracy of, of the bank. So from a very young age, I learned to speak up and not to be afraid uh, to speak up. But I, I never planned to be at the UN. Uh, but when the Prime Minister Netanyahu offered me the position, uh, I didn't hesitate. I told him I have to consult with my wife because the family thing, we have to relocate to the US with our three children. But I told him that uh, I see that a challenge. And by the way, many of my colleagues in the government, they were very skeptical. They told me, Daniel, you are doing a mistake. You, you don't leave a post of a minister in the government uh, to go to, to, the, to the UN. And I told him, that's my passion. Uh, and I think I can do a good job. And I, I will come back. Don't worry. Some of them were very happy that I, I actually uh, left uh, my position in the government. But uh, I think when I come back today with uh, the experience, with the global understanding, with the connections, uh, I can do much more to promote my values and my ideology. Well, looking back on uh, the five years you've spent at the UN, uh, how is Israel's position at the world body evolved in, in your view? And um, what are your proudest accomplishments in New York? So first, uh, I will repeat it today. We are in a very good situation, despite anti-Semitism and not never is leading the fight on this issue, despite the hostile resolution of the UN General Assembly. When you look at the numbers, we have bilateral relations with more than 160 countries, uh, which is amazing. With many more, we have quiet uh, relationships. Uh, I visited a few of the Arab countries in the last few years, uh, and we are doing a lot of things quietly. I, I think the challenge is to take the great bilateral relations and to transform it to great multilateral relations. So to see them changing the way they vote and speak about Israel, we are seeing it already in Africa, Latin America, and other places. For me, the greatest achievement was the moment I was elected to become the chairman of the legal committee. We have six permanent committees at the UN. When I decided to run for this position, my colleagues in Jerusalem, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they told me, Dan, you are out of your mind, Danny. No one is running for a seat in, in the UN. There is no way we can win. And, uh, and uh, Alan knows me for many years ago when I was active in the, in the WZO. I always ran for position, also in the party. I, I think it's good. Even if you lose, I, I think it's a good thing to, uh, to be active and to, to build bridges. And when I ran for this position, many in Israel were very skeptical. And I walked quietly. Uh, there was a strong opposition uh, mainly from the Arab League and the Palestinians. But at the end of the day, uh, when we counted the votes, it was a secret uh, ballot in the General Assembly. Uh, I received the support of 109 member states and 44 voted against me. Uh, and it proved to me that we can do everything at the UN. And a few months after, when I entered the, the room, 
and I chaired the legal committee for the entire year. Uh, it was a great uh, achievement for me. And I think for the future, from now on, uh, every Israeli ambassador and diplomat can run for every position at the UN. Well, the UN is a notoriously hostile environment, uh, especially for Israel. Uh, so when you began your position, uh, you must have understood the many challenges uh, you'd find yourself up against. Uh, but until you spend some time engaging with your staff, with colleagues, with counterparts, with other ambassadors, it's difficult to get a sense of how things are. What were some of the surprises that you encountered along the way? So actually, you know, from what I heard from my uh, colleagues and uh, my friends in Israel, you know, I thought that everybody would be against us. And I found out that we have a lot of friends. Uh, and the challenge is to actually ask them to speak publicly about the way they feel about Israel. Uh, and and uh, I spent a lot of energy on doing that. And uh, I, we see the results, and as I mentioned, with the African leaders, uh, I also brought many ambassadors to Israel. Over the years, I led missions to Israel, and more than 100 UN ambassadors came with me to Israel. And I think when you spend more time with them, you find out that we have a lot in common with many, many countries from all around the world. So for me, it was a surprise to see that people are actually admire Israel. Uh, but at the same time, you know, sometimes when you see the amount of energy that the uh, missions to the UN are putting into anti-Israel uh, resolutions, uh, it is ridiculous. You know, they put so much energy into those resolutions. Just to uh, follow up a bit on your bringing the uh, ambassadors uh, over to, uh, to Israel, we have a, a similar program. We bring diplomats from UN duty stations in New York and Paris and Geneva to Israel. Um, in your conversations with the ambassadors uh, who've taken these trips, um, what were some of, of the key takeaways? Uh, what, what, what most impressed these ambassadors, most of whom I assume had never been to Israel before? But uh, I want to thank Nebrit for, for doing uh, those programs and uh, we, we worked with you to taking uh, senior diplomats to Israel. And I found out that you know, many times we Israelis, including myself, and I was Deputy Minister of Defense, we focus too much on security issues. For us, issues like Hezbollah and Hamas, it, it's crucial. So we, we take them to see the tunnels coming from Lebanon, the tunnels coming from Gaza, I remember taking Ambassador Haley to the tunnel. But I found out that many of the diplomats, they actually remember the small things, mainly about technology and innovation. One of the ambassadors, when I spoke with him after we came back to New York, and I, I reflected with him about the trip, and I told him what was the highlight. I, and I was sure he would tell me the helicopter ride, meeting the prime minister, the chief of staff of the military. And he told me, Danny, the day you took us to visit uh, the field of the bananas and mangoes, and I saw the way you actually cultivating your agriculture, for me, it was the most important day. So we Israelis, we don't, we think iron dome. We think, you know, innovation of the military, that, that's the, the most exciting thing. But for many ambassadors, we deal with the sustainable development, for them, the issues of water, food security, and the health, uh, are the main issues, and I think we can do more in terms of doing tikkun olam and uh, offering solutions to the problem of the world. Well, you, know, you brought some interesting issues out at the UN, uh, important to all of us. Uh, one was the issue of anti-Semitism, another was the, the question of, of Jews from Arab countries, the refugees who came from the Arab countries. So uh, a few days ago, uh, Miguel Moratinos, uh, the former Spanish foreign minister, uh, was recently announced as what's being called the UN focal point uh, to monitor anti-Semitism. Uh, we know that anti-Semitism is a significant problem at the UN relating to, uh, to BDS uh, and, and, and to so many other uh, iterations of anti-Semitism. If you were to give advice to Moratinos, um, on where anti-Semitism is most acute and what must be addressed most urgently? What, what would you tell them? So first I agree with you, it's a, it's a real issue. And I, I have dealt with that. You know, I, I initiated a conference against the BDS movement in the General Assembly Hall, which was very uh, important. 
we pushed a resolution condemning anti-Semitism and we got it passed in the General Assembly. And I want to thank the Secretary General uh, for his uh, strong uh, standing against anti-Semitism. I know that he, he met uh, with you and your uh, leadership a few times and he's committed to, to this issue. And my advice to them is not to wait for a special occasion or special day. Anti-Semitism is everywhere, unfortunately, and I think that we have to monitor it on a daily basis. And also not to look every time when I speak with my colleagues, they tell me, yeah, we know that you have issues in East, Eastern Europe or issues there. And I tell them, what about the issues in your country? And today, when you look at the map then, whether it will be Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Latin America, even the United States of America, we do have that problem. So I, I expect that the, the UN uh, will deal with that uh, on an ongoing uh, uh, base. I still don't know, uh, I know Mr. Morotinos very well, but I still don't know exactly what will be if the scope of his activities. It requires a full-time representative, uh, even a full-time uh, uh, envoy uh, to deal with this issue. Well, we hear a lot about changing dynamics in the Middle East uh, with uh, Arab states, uh, some Arab states seeing Israel as a partner against the threat posed by Iran and Muslim extremist groups like ISIS. Um, what can you tell us about your relationships with the moderate Arab states at the UN uh, that may not be as apparent uh, when looking at the voting patterns or resolutions that are introduced on, on the floor of the General Assembly or uh, anywhere else in the UN system? So I can share with you that, that we, we collaborate with the moderate Arab countries uh, in very practical ways at the UN. It can be in resolutions, in a language resolutions, and we have a common enemy, uh, the threat of the Iranian regime. It is a real threat. And I remember when I visited uh, Dubai a few years ago, and I had a discussion with officials uh, over there. They told me, Danny, for you in Tel Aviv, we don't really fear the Iranian. But over here, we believe that the first missile fly to Abu Dhabi and Dubai, it will not fly to Tel Aviv. And I agreed with them, because we Israelis, we are concerned about the Iranians. But when you come to Israel and you all come a lot, you know, people are, are not afraid. We, we live happily with one of the happiest uh, nations uh, among the, all nations of the world. But the, the countries that I mentioned in the Gulf, they actually, they live in fear that the Iranian will take over, that the Iranian will send the nuclear uh, rockets and or missiles, God forbid, uh, to their capital. So I think it brought us together uh, and today we collaborate not only on this issue, but this issue was the, the, the reason that ignited the process to come together. During your tenure, uh, Israel has grown closer to states in Africa. Um, can you describe some of the ways that Israeli-African ties have flourished uh, during this period? And where do you see these relationships going in the future? So I think we have to invest a lot uh, on those relations. You know, uh, I organized an event with the Prime Minister of Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu, and leaders from Africa in the UN General Assembly. And before the event, which was very nice, we, we presented our technologies and capabilities. We had a, a closed meeting uh, to discuss issues with the, with the leader. And one of them said, you know, I remember that you Israelis, you built my nation, you know, the infrastructure, the roads, the parliament building, it was all built by Israeli companies in the 60s. Uh, unfortunately, after the Yom Kippur War in 1973, the Arab League put pressure on the African Union and most African nations decided to, to boycott Israel. And, and now it's changing. Now they are working with us. There are the great opportunities for, for both sides. Uh, and I think they understand that we can help them uh, a lot. Uh, and we want to help them. Uh, if you look at the number of visits of the Prime Minister in Africa in the last five years, it shows that we, we want to do more. Uh, we are opening uh, more embassies in Africa. And we have strong friends that they are not afraid to stand with Israel. And uh, usually I don't like to mention names. But uh, on this uh, case, I will take Rwanda, for example. They decided to publicly stand with Israel. And some told them, you're going to lose a lot uh, with the Arabs. You're going to lose a lot 
with the African Union. And I think President Kagame, he proved to everybody that you can be a friend of Israel and be a successful leader uh, regardless of the support you give to Israel. And I think it was very important because today we, we see other countries uh, following the, the footsteps of President Kagame and uh, publicly acknowledging the opportunities uh, and the will to cooperate with us. No, I think it's interesting that you say that because, uh, I mean, going back, I mean, I recall uh, when um, the number of countries with which Israel had diplomatic relations was under 100, well under 100, full diplomatic relations. And now, you know, you're saying that it's, it's up to over 100, 150 countries. Um, so clearly, uh, more and more countries are learning that there is no downside. You know, the, the worry always was that there would be some kind of retribution or retaliation but that there is no downside. On the contrary, that uh, there's a lot of uh, positive um, elements to this uh, in terms of an upside. And, and you've played a role in that. Absolutely. And I think, uh, and I, I would say it's uh, out front, we should do more. We should do more. Israel is a strong nation. We have a strong economy. Uh, and we can do more in terms of sharing the, the technology and innovation with uh, those African countries. And I think in the long run, it will be beneficial for our economy because you look at the potential of those markets. And I think that the government should build programs to give incentives to companies to go to Africa and to go more to, to those places and to build more bridges. Well, in terms of key challenges that Israel faces, I mean, we know every year we have, for example, item seven in Geneva. Uh, we have, uh, we've had issues at UNESCO, uh, even within the World Health Organization, I know uh, on occasion there have been resolutions. Um, what are the key challenges as, as you look ahead uh, for your successor? Um, what are the key challenges that Israel faces at the UN uh, going forward? And, and I'm sure you, you've spoken with your successor, uh, but if you had to give him one piece of advice, could you share that with us? What, what is the, the key issue here looking ahead? So when I look back and I look ahead, uh, I see the Iranian threat all over. You know, I, when I look at the issues I had to deal with, whether it's Hezbollah on the border with Lebanon, whether it's the radicals in Syria, uh, instability uh, in the Sinai Peninsula, it's, it's all comes from one source of funding and training uh, in the Iranian regime. So they will still be there. They will continue to promote the instability in the region. They will continue to fund uh, their proxies. Uh, and uh, I think we have to focus on that. Uh, if we speak practically, uh, you have the arm embargo, but uh, in October, the Security Council will have to decide whether to extend uh, the arm embargo uh, or not, uh, which is a crucial, crucial issue for us and for the US. Uh, and, and I think we, we have to watch very carefully what's happening in Tehran. Uh, because unlike other players in the UN who speaks against Israel, the Iranians not only do they speak against us, but they actually act against us. They spend seven billion dollars a year then promoting terrorism. So take Turkey for example. We don't like to hear Mr. Erdogan speaking about Israel. Uh, we condemn it. But when you compare what he is doing to what the Iranians are doing, to understand that this regime is serious uh, about exporting the revolution, uh, supporting radical uh, forces. And that's why whenever you see uh, instability in the region, you can find the fingerprints of the Iranians. Tell us how important the US-Israel relationship is at the UN. You had a, an excellent working relationship with Nikki Haley um, and with the US mission to the UN. Uh, just comment on that because it's, we, we of course feel it's, it's so important, but you're right there on the floor uh, in, the, in the well of the, uh, the General Assembly Hall. Um, tell us your insight into how important that is. So that, that's uh, crucial. And I had the pleasure to work with three uh, US ambassadors to the UN, Ambassador Samantha Powell, Ambassador Nikki Haley, and uh, Ambassador Kerry Kraft. And we work very close with all of them, with the previous administration and with this administration. We cannot ignore uh, what happened in December 2016, uh, when a resolution was 
pushed forward to the Security Council resolution 2334. That was an unfortunate incident. Uh, the first and only time that I experienced uh, a situation where the US was not standing with me. Uh, and it was difficult for me also personally that I, I was working against the US in the Security Council. And I had to speak with other ambassadors and to try to block the resolution by myself. But uh, most of the time, we do it together. And, and people appreciate it. And I think it's important for Israel, but it's also important for the US because once you support your allies, you get respected by others. And every year, there is a vote uh, done about uh, the, the sanctions against Cuba in the General Assembly. Uh, and I told my staff, this is a, a vote I cannot miss. I, I make sure that I will be in, in, the, in New York on that day. Uh, and I walk proud into the General Assembly and I vote with the US on this resolution. And usually the numbers are, are, are very clear. 191 states will condemn the US policy regarding Cuba, and the US and Israel uh, will be by, by themselves. So it it's goes both ways. Most of the time, the US standing with Israel, supporting Israel. Uh, but I think it, uh, it also brings more respect uh, to the US. And that's what I told Ambassador Haley. That they, you know, she spoke very vocally about standing with Israel, and she gained respect because of that. And the U.S. that uh, more respect. And today we see the same from Ambassador Kelly Craft. Well, looking at the 75th anniversary of the U.N., I mean, I, I asked the question not only because it's a, a special anniversary, but B'nai B'rith actually was present in San Francisco in 1945. Uh, when the UN was founded, there were just a few Jewish organizations that were invited uh, to that uh, event. And you know, at the time, it, this was the UN was built on the ashes of the Holocaust, um, on the on the uh, at the conclusion of of World War II. Um, now we're seventy five years on. Uh, what do you think the organization needs to do to finally live up to its founding mission, its founding ideals? So first, you know, many in Israel ask me, why do we need the UN? Why do we participate uh, in the UN? Uh, and I tell them, we need that body. It's a very important organization. The fact that we, you have all nations in one building talking, not fighting, uh, it's meaningful. But unfortunately, we, we see that today, the UN is spending a lot of money uh, and don't see the results that uh, we expect. So I think the UN should focus uh, on the main issues and should restructure the activities of the UN. I will give you one example. Uh, I served in the Knesset for many years before coming to the UN. And when I passed the legislation in the Israeli Knesset, that was it. You pass the legislation and you move on. In the UN General Assembly, every year you bring to the floor the same resolutions and you discuss the same resolution. And I ask myself, why? Why to spend so much energy, time, and funding uh, passing the same resolutions every year? So I think the structure uh, is not uh, effective anymore. It is about time to, to restructure uh, the UN. And today you have uh, also countries that were not relevant 75 years ago. And today they are much more relevant. And they should uh, participate uh, and be more active in the, in the body of the UN. Well, we have time for just a couple more questions. Here's a, a one submitted by one of our audience members. What do you think the prospects are for international cooperation on major challenges like the COVID-19 pandemic? So I think we have to acknowledge that first, the first response was isolation. Every country closed the borders and to curl all their own uh, citizens. That was the first reaction. Uh, after a while, we all realized we have to work together. And I'm very optimistic because today I see the, the cooperation uh, between uh, the researchers in Israel and the European and the US experts. Uh, and it shows that we understand that we have to work together. Uh, by the way, I, I know that many countries are pushing for the vaccine. Uh, I hope that it will come from Israel. It would be a great answer for the BDS supporters then to, to imagine there would be in the pharmacy 
and they will have to decide whether they are purchasing the, the vaccine who was made in Israel. That, that will be the moment. Uh, but you know, the thing, the cooperation between the different teams, I think it shows that uh, we have to work together. And I will add that in terms of the WHO, we have to pay more attention to this space. You know, for many years, you know, we neglected to pay attention uh, who is leading the organization, is the transparency, the budget of the organization. And I think that now after we experienced COVID-19, we all have to pay uh, more attention and, and to look very carefully what's happening there. Uh, here's another one, um, very current. Uh, the cause of the explosion in Beirut is still unclear, but what has been abundantly clear over the years has been Hezbollah's malign influence in Lebanon, uh, Syria, the region, and the world, and this includes storing weapons in civilian areas. Do you anticipate a stronger responses at the UN against uh, Hezbollah in the near future as a result of this or as a result of their, of their malign activity? So last year when I spoke in, in the Security Council, I said very clearly that the port of Beirut became the port of Hezbollah uh, uh, because we, we got the intelligence and I, and I spoke about it publicly that they're actually using the, the airport and the port to transport the uh, uh, weapons and, uh, and other things that uh, are very dangerous for all. Uh, we, we, we all... Uh, respect uh, the Lebanese people. We, we know that they are suffering today. We send our condolences to the people there. But we do criticize not only Hezbollah, but also the Lebanese government, because they allow Hezbollah to do all of those activities. And with many discussions I had with the leaders uh, from countries that support Lebanon, and it includes the US, France, and, and many other countries around the world, I tell you, it's okay that you support the Lebanese government, the Lebanese uh, military, but you have to demand more in terms of seeing what's happening with Hezbollah. Because, for example, when we see cooperation between Hezbollah and the Lebanese army, so you ask yourself why uh, the US or other countries should give uh, any funding to this army if they allow Hezbollah uh, to take over a few units over there. So I, I think we should be all demand more from the Lebanese government to push Hezbollah out of the government, out of the border with Israel. Uh, it will make the life of the Lebanese people much safer and much better. And here's our final question, maybe, maybe the most important question. Uh, now that your term as ambassador is ending, what are your plans to continue serving in the public sector? So first, now I, I will be able to speak uh, freely about everything. You know, it was uh, challenging for me coming from the Knesset and the government uh, to work uh, diplomatically, where you have to uh, write everything and read your statements. It wasn't easy uh, at the beginning. So now I, I look, I'm eager to go back and, uh, and speak openly about uh, the issue. And I come back to Israel uh, with better skills, better knowledge, better understanding, uh, and I, I will put that into action uh, to support the people of Israel. So I intend to stay active in public life uh, and I will continue to work with passion. You know, I will bring my passion uh, to Israeli uh, politics, to the public life. Uh, and I think uh, uh, my friends and colleagues will appreciate uh, the experience and knowledge I come with. Well, Danny, really good luck going forward in, in all that you do. Thank you for your service these past five years. and before that, of course. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you to uh, Bnebrit for what you do. Uh, and we will continue to, to fight together, to stand together, and together uh, we will prevail. So that Well, I want to thank Ambassador Danny Danone for being with us today and speaking to us about his experiences serving Israel at the United Nations. A recording of this conversation will be available on demand on our YouTube channel shortly. And I want to thank all of you today for joining us. I hope that you will come back for future conversations. For my guest, Ambassador Danny Danone, take care. Continue to be well. We'll see you again soon.